Good morning, Advanced Church. Welcome to a beautiful Sunday morning. Wherever you are right now, we want to invite you to come worship with us. My name is Glenn Pellius, and along with the team this morning, we'll be leading worship for you today. So come on, get yourselves ready, and let's sing to the Lord this morning.
You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we were able to come together and worship. And we ask that as the word is being brought to us this morning, that you would help us as we open up our ears and open up our hearts to hear and receive from you today. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Surviving Isolation, Day 50. Yes, Day 50. Boredom has taken over the camp. It's not that we don't have things to do. We do. But the daily routines in which we find ourselves are becoming monotonous. So boredom is a problem. I think everyone's just looking for some kind of hope. How long can we continue to do this without something to bring us hope? There was discussion that there was something hidden in the camp, an item something that would bring hope to whoever found it. They called it an immunity item. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know how big it was. I didn't know where it was hidden. But I decided if it exists, then I'm going to look for it. I, I need hope. So I searched and I searched and I searched high and low. And then finally, one day in the crevices, I found it. I found it. And this is what it is. This is what it looks like. This, my friends, is the sacred immunity item. This has given me such hope. Why? Because if they try to vote me out, I have this. It's like my golden ticket. If they try to vote me out, all I have to say is that if I'm going, these are going. And that will end the discussion. You know what they say is when you search for hope, you're going to find it because you will find what you look for. Good morning, Advanced Church, and welcome back to our Survivor Series. And as you've seen for those clips, it just goes to show you, if you look hard enough, you're going to find something. And that's kind of the theme that we're kind of going with this morning. Uh, we've been in this series, and it's a series with the intent to give you some tools on how to deal with this trying time that we're in and we kind of started the series off with this question of is this going to make or break you is this series um, gives you some tools we wanted to put into your hands this thought that god is in your in your circumstance and if we understand who god is in our circumstance it's going to carry us through our circumstances and of course shonda talked last week about this this process of of divine rest that divine rest can happen in and amongst the storm and the chaos that we find our lives. And she posed the thought that we need to give all of uh, the questions to God. We need to commit how things are going to play out here. We need to commit what's going to happen and when it's all going to happen. And all of those whys we take to God, we take to the who. Who are we trusting? Who is it that we lean on? 
in this time. So what I wanted to do today was to give you two final thoughts as we conclude this series. And those two words are choice and intention. Choice and intention. So let me first talk about choice. When it comes to difficult situations in our life, it gives us the opportunity to become either a vessel or a student of God's grace or a victim of our circumstance. Let me say that again. We have a choice that in every difficult situation we find ourselves, we have an opportunity to choose either to be the vessel or a student of God's grace or a victim of our circumstance. Are you more focused on the problem or are you more focused on God? And I was reminded of a story in Genesis about a guy named Abraham. And in Genesis 12, we read sort of the start of his story and God calls him. And it's in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it says this, Lord, bless the reading of your word. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Abraham is asked by God to leave the comforts of his land and go west to another land that he's never seen and doesn't know. And so he does. He doesn't know exactly where it is, but it also says in Hebrews 11, as it recounts this story in verse 8 and 9 of Hebrews 11, it says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Sounds great. And he went out. Good for him. Not knowing where he was going. Hmm, not so great. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise. Sounds great again as in a foreign land, living in tents. Not so great. So by faith, Abraham is following God's call in his life. And after a whole bunch of difficulty, the emotions of leaving his home, and the long travel and distance, and not exactly knowing where it is, but he finally makes it to the promised land. And what does he find when he gets there? Nothing. There's no one there to greet him. There's no parade. There's, there's no fancy hotel to check into. Uh, people don't even care that he's arrived. <laughs> and, and no one gives him anything. In fact, we read that in Hebrews 11.9, it says he's just living in tents. Nobody cares that he's here. There's no luxury living in the promised land. He's not even glamping. He is in tents with his family. God has promised him this land. And all the blessings with it. And he's literally scratching out his existence in tents. And then, to top it off, just shortly after he gets there, a famine hits the land. Really? Why? I mean, I, I followed God, Abraham's probably thinking to himself. And here I am in this desolate land, and I'm scratching out my existence, and I'm in a tent, and a famine hits the land. This doesn't feel like the blessing that you were talking about, God. So was Abraham in the will of God? Yes. Was he right to leave his land? Yes. Was he doing what God wanted him to do? Yes. Pay attention to that truth. So why then... Was he struggling and living in tents in a famine? He doesn't understand it. Something we do need to understand is that God's timetable is not the same as ours. God's not in a big hurry to make sure that all the blessings happen when we want them to happen. In fact, God uses circumstances, good and bad, to grow us, to test us, to build us, to make us. And so we have a choice. We want the blessing of the land. We want what was promised to us. And the blessings did come. If you read the story of Abraham and of the Israelites, the blessings do come. But they come way, way after we anticipate maybe they should. You see, God stretches across the generations to accomplish his purposes. We are more interested in what we're wearing for the next Zoom meeting. 
and there's where the two perspectives are very different. <laughs> you see, I like to call this, uh, God works in what I like to call the ultimate. He works in the ultimate plan, the ultimate purpose, the ultimate seeing of the future and the blessing of it all. Versus us, who sort of live in this immediate. We, we even have this sort of cause and effect mindset, which in and of itself isn't wrong. It's just sometimes very inaccurate. So let me give you an example. I obey God. That's awesome. And so I expect that my life is going to be peachy and perfect because I do what God tells me to do and I'm living under his blessing. How about this one? Uh, I have finances. God calls me to be generous and to tithe and to give. And so I do all those things and I anticipate even based on what I learn in scripture about the blessing of being a generous person, I'm expecting finances to instantly and forever be plentiful. Or someone needs healing and so I go and pray for them, believing in faith, with lots of faith, that God can and will heal them. And I'm expecting that as soon as I lay hands on them and pray for them, they will instantly be healed and they'll never have this problem again in their lives. Sometimes that's how it works. But often it's a much longer process. God does work in the cause and effect. He does bless those who obey him and follow his commands and live by his principles but not always in the timing that we think they should happen. Chandra mentioned last week this process that we're often on. God works in the ultimate, sometimes in the immediate, but ultimately he works in his plan, his purpose over his time, which is perfect. Overall, it's usually a process. But we have a choice in the process. You see, Abraham was a dedicated man to God. If you read his story, you see the relationship that he had with God. He, he sacrificed everything for God. He sacrificed his career. He gave up his security. He traveled a long distance. He couldn't even find a home when he got there. And he's living in tents. And now there's a famine. How do you explain this? And as it turns out, the famine hit and Abraham left the promised land. He went down to Egypt and he lied to Pharaoh about his wife. And it was, it was a, a mess. It was just a mess. He ended up on his wrong path. But it doesn't make sense. Abraham's come to this promised land. He's expecting blessing. And it doesn't feel like a blessing. Why the famine? Why the tests? And we could ask in this point, what's the point? Not just for Abraham, but for ourselves. What is the point of what we're going through right now? What is the point of COVID-19? The answer, and you're probably not going to like it, is that the test is the point. The test is the point. Theologian Donald Barnhouse commented that just as every coin has a head and a tail... So every event in life either draws us to God or leads us away from him. But it's about a choice. It's a choice that we have that in every difficult situation that you face, it's an opportunity to be, to be a vessel of God's grace, to see God work in miraculous ways, or you can be a victim to your circumstance. We are always being tested. The journey of life is a test, constantly. And when the faith comes, or when the famine comes, remember that God has not left you alone. God loved Abraham. God loves you. God hasn't abandoned him or us. But he's given us an opportunity to trust him in the difficult situations. In the moments when trouble hits, we tend to have this victim mentality. Oh no, I can't believe this has happened to me yet again. And I don't understand it. And, and I'm worried about now. And I'm worried and distraught about the future. Or we could choose to see it a different way. 
yes, this is a difficult time, but it's an opportunity to trust God again. You know, a friend of mine recently lost his job, as some of you have as well. And in the comment of losing his job, he said, but I'm excited to see where God's going to take me next. And I thought, that was a choice. That was a choice to see his scenario, his situation, the way he did. To see it as an opportunity to receive God's grace and miracles in this moment. Or he could have chosen to be the victim. I'm like, oh no, I'm one of the many that lost their jobs and distraught. And, and maybe those emotions are still there, but he's verbally choosing to say, God has got me. He hasn't abandoned me, and he's got the ultimate plan and purpose in this. I just got to find it. I've just got to trust him. It's not easy to say these things, but it is a choice that we must try to make continually. Let me say this as a, a side note. Sometimes it takes more grace to stay in the promised land than it did to even get there. You know, think of Abraham and, and all that he left and, and all of the hard, difficult travel time that he had. But in that moment, he's still like, God promised this land to us and there's blessing there and there was dreams even amidst and there was grace in that journey. But then he gets to the promised land and all those illusions disappear. And he's left with this, oh, this is not what I thought the promised land was going to be. But even in that, he needs God's grace. What would have happened if Abraham had stayed in the promised land when the famine came? Would he have learned to trust God in a brand new way? To give God a chance to meet his needs without resorting to panic and running away to Egypt? We don't know. Again, what is your focal point, the problem or God? Now, focusing on our problems leads to confusion and discouragement. We, we kind of all know that. And it generally puts us on the wrong path. And, and just as Chandra taught us last week, we have to take all of those whys, I don't understand, to God. We trust in God, and he, he gives us this sol solid ground of hope. Now, I, I think I'm a pretty smart guy. I do. But I'm, I am not smart. Let, hear me. I am not smart enough to reason my way through my problems to God. I'm not smart enough to do that. I don't know how to do that. When I'm so focused on my problems, I can't seem to reason my way to God. But if I push my problems aside and I put my focal point in Jesus, if I put my eyes on God and say, God, this is a difficult time, but I, I'm, I'm focusing on you, I can reason my way through the circumstances and the problems because I know that God's bigger than the problem. I come to that realization when I put him as my focal point. It's, it's a choice. And I don't become overwhelmed by the problems I become overwhelmed by God. Some of you are dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. I, I've talked to many, and I, I know a lot of the situations that are going on. But you have a choice. God has given you a choice that in the difficult situations, you have an opportunity to either be that victim of circumstance or... Choose to believe God can get you through this and see God's grace and mercy and miracles in the scenario. So that's the first thing. It, it's, it's having this choice to choose God or, or fall into the trap of the woe is me in your problems. The second thing and the last thing I kind of want to really wrap up this series with is intention. So we have choice, but we also have to have intention. What do I mean by that? Are you looking for the food in the famine? Maybe better, better put, are you looking for the treasure in the tragedy? It's an intentional decision. Now, 
I don't know if all of you do this, but I, I sometimes tend to shop at thrift stores. Uh, you know the thrift store. And the thrift store is a little bit different than any other store. There's that unique smell. <laughs> Not a good one. It's unique because uh, it's a store filled with old, used, and who knows where they came from type of products. And it is full of junk. It's someone's junk because someone got rid of it. And there's probably some treasures there. You know the old saying that one man's trash is another man's treasure. That has to be true or there wouldn't be thrift stores and successful garage sales. And so we, we can come to a thrift store and, and there's a few things that are unsettling about the thrift store. And, and maybe the biggest thing is that it has no predictable supply. You never know what's going to be there from week to week or from month to month. It's always changing. It's not a predictable supply of items. And the ultimate question when you walk into a thrift store and perhaps try to touch something, especially in this season, that you would think uh, it's more readily on our minds is how many hands have touched that product? And I'm not talking about just the customers that came in or the people that work there and stock the shelf. I'm talking about where it came from, how many kids, how many hands, the person that delivered it, the person that played with it, the person that had it before that person because it was, it was their treasure and their trash and maybe even another one before that. How many hands have been on this product? How dirty is this thing? And, and did it come from a smoker's home? Did it come from someone who had pets? Uh, did it come from a drug dealer? Did it come from a dead man's estate? We don't know. And what's interesting is that you can go to the employees there and say, hey, do you know where this came from? And they like, I don't know. It just showed up in a bag outside the door this morning. They literally don't know the history of this product and where it's been. I mean, does, does the little girl know that her mom raided her closet and cleaned it out and put the dolls into the bag and sent it to the thrift store? I don't know. I could, be, I could be shopping for toys for my kids and some kids crying somewhere because they can't find their toy. Ooh, mom, mom threw it away. So many stories, so many unknowns. And it's somewhat disorderly. I mean, yes, thrift stores have sections. You know, it's the antiques and the toys and maybe the shoe section, the clothing section. But it's so random of what comes in, how much comes in, how little comes in, how big it is, how small it is, that they can't really organize it that well. It's just sort of disorderly. And it's dirty because these are old people's, young people's used items that have been around for maybe even years, collecting dust in someone's closet or, or garage. But ultimately, and this, man, this really catches me when it comes to life. Ultimately, with a thrift store, you have to relinquish the expectation of finding something particular. Let me say that again. You have to relinquish the expectation of finding something particular. Now, maybe Abraham was on his way to the promised land and had all these thoughts of what it would be like. What blessing meant when God told him he would be a blessing, that they would be blessed. He probably had an idea of what he thought that might look like. But when he got to the promised land, at least at the beginning, that is not what he found. And I think that that is very much the way life goes for us, that we have to relinquish this expectation of what exactly things are, are going to look like, how it's all going to go down. You can't wake up in the morning and decide, you know what, I'm going to go down to that thrift store and buy a 15-inch silver platter so I can put my silver tea set on it. And I'm going to pay $5. You can't make that prediction. You might want that to be the way it happens. And if you're lucky enough, stuff like that happens. But you can't wake up and just say, that's the way it's going to be. Life is too unpredictable. <clears throat> If you're lucky enough, uh, if you're lucky enough, you do find treasures like I did. I have something in my my pocket here. Um, I, I don't know if this is the exact car, but uh, this is a Disney movie cars toy. And uh, my oldest son started collecting the racers in the movie 
when he was young, and then as he grew up, <clears throat> he passed that collection and the responsibility to find all the cars in that movie to my son Jaden. And so there's 36 different racers from that movie, and then they came out with Cars 2, and that had a set of racers, and they came out with Cars 3, and they have racers in that one. And so we've just like, over time, over the years, trying to collect these cars. Now we have all the ones from movie one and movie two, and we're working on movie three, and that's gonna take forever. But the point is, at the time, I, I was going to this store, and I, I, I needed about 12 more of these. This was several years ago. <clears throat> now I didn't wake up thinking, I'm gonna go to the thrift store and find a car at the thrift store. I went into the store, I went to the uh, section, the toys area, disorderly as it was. It was around Christmas and so I was just looking for the little treasures that might find for my daughter, for my sons. And then I saw this bag of cars. I know Jaden likes cars of all kinds, so I thought maybe there'll be a cool one in there. And I looked in this bag and one of these cars is in the bag and I'm freaking out because we live in Canada, so we don't get the same kind of supply and demand that the Americans do. And so a lot of these cars don't even make it to us. Of the 36, I don't think all of them even made it into Canada. And here's one of those cars sitting inside the bag. And I'm like, if I pay $4, I'm gonna get all these cars and this $7 car that I'm looking and probably can't even find in the country. And I was elated. I was so excited because I found this treasure in amongst all of this stuff. Listen, life offers problems and dilemmas and opportunities with about as much predictability as products found in a thrift store. You can plan, you can predict, you, you can prepare all that you want, but in the end, we have no control over what's in that thrift store and we have no control over what's happening in our life or what's gonna come. We can't custom order our lives. We need to see that God is in control, not us. His timetable is different. Tests will come. And we have to be intentional to find the goodness of God in the aspects of our lives. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, after telling us not to be anxious about anything and letting God provide peace in all of our lives, he says this in verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Basically, Paul is saying, look, you need to be intentional to find the goodness in whatever place you can find it. Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is commendable or honorable, think on these things. If you can find literally anything worthy of praise, then think on that. If there's anything, anywhere, whatever it is, find good in it. Find the treasure in the tragedy. Be intentional. Essentially, we need to learn to sort through the mess of the thrift stores of our lives to find the treasure. In the Survivor show, and you've seen clips that we've been doing, this whole show is kind of, or this whole series is kind of based on that show. You see in the show all of these people who become full of despair and discouragement, and they're, um, they're tired, and the sun is hot, and the sand is everywhere, and they, they just seem so distraught. And then when there's this glimmer of hope that there might be an immunity item somewhere hidden on the island. It's like all of their energy resurges and they all go out searching and searching and searching for this item. They don't know where it is. They don't know what it's wrapped in. They don't know where it's hidden. They don't know what size it is. Is it big? Is it small? What's actually going to be in there? They just know there's value in it. There's a treasure to be found and they almost always find it. Why? Because they're intent to find it. They don't understand all the details of this item. They just know that it's a glimmer. It represents a glimmer of hope. 
you, when you go to a thrift store, maybe you have a mindset of this yuck. You know, it's dirty and it's all used and it's smelly and why would I want to buy someone else's trash? You know, and if you're able to look past all of that, you might find a treasure. You can encounter so much in life and life can be a bit of a mess. And as I said earlier, you can take the opportunity in your circumstances to either see God's hand in it or, or just be a victim to the circumstance. But when you decide, when you're intentional to look for God's goodness in the mess, when you intentionally look for the treasure in the treasure, the food in the famine, in the promised land, you are going to see blessing. You're going to find what you're looking for. Let me close with this verse from Isaiah 45, verse 3. And this is God speaking. He says, I'll lead you to buried treasures, to secret caches of valuables, confirmations that it is, in fact, I, God, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. One of the small groups that I am part of, we recently talked about that very thing. We talked about the hidden treasures of God, the secrets that God has, and he, he desires relationship with us, and he, he has hidden treasures for each one of us, secrets just between him and you. He has that kind of intimate ability to have all of these treasures lined up for us, but we need to be intentional to look for them. They're there. I'm telling you, the Bible speaks of them. And so let your energy surge again in faith, in hope, because God has hidden treasures waiting for you to discover in this season and every other season. So whatever your trouble is, whether it's boredom or job loss or sickness or worry or oppression, know this, what you look for, you will find. If you're looking for bad, I guarantee you're going to find it. But if you're looking for the goodness of God, I also guarantee that you will find it. Find the treasures in your tragedies. Because what we find is what we are looking for in the first place. It's an intentional choice. On a side note, as I close, maybe you're like Abraham and you're in the promised land, living in a tent, the famine hits, and you're just kind of tired of waiting for the blessing. It's like, God, I know you promised this, but where is it? Can I encourage you to do two things? This is like a side devotional. Look up and look back. In your tragedy, in your situation, in your famine, whatever it is, look up to God. Seek Him first. And you will find His faithfulness right in the moment. But not only that, when you look back, when you look in the past and you look for the treasures that God has given along the way in your life, you will find them. You will see the faithfulness of God, how he's molded you, how he's changed you, how he's used these circumstances in your past to show his faithfulness and to make you who you are. So I encourage you, if you're in that waiting moment, and it seems like this season is very much a waiting season, look up and look back. You, you will see the faithfulness of God when you look for those treasures with intent. Can we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God full of treasures, for being a faithful God in the now, in the past, and in the future. God, I am thankful that you, you see in the ultimate. You see the ultimate plan, the ultimate purpose, and the ultimate timing of blessings. God, would you help us see beyond the immediate? Would you help us bring our focal point back to you? God, I commit to make a choice to make you my focal point in these circumstances of life and to intentionally look for the treasures you have waiting for me as I trust you. If there's anyone that's hearing this message who, who needs to know God, who desires a, a different alternative to a life that maybe is full of despair and, 
lacking hope. The Bible says this, and it says it many places, that if we seek God with all of our hearts, you'll find him. Guaranteed. Every time. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're searching for answers for something other than the proverbial famine that you find yourself in. God calls us to make a choice. To intentionally choose Him through Christ who died for us. To walk away from the sinful things in our life and to walk instead towards Him. And to live in Him and for Him. And if that's you, all you need to do is call on His name. You can say something as simple as this. God, I need you. God, I, I need you to forgive me and I want you to guide me. I commit my life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you made that decision today to follow Christ, to make your focal point, your life uh, line up with His, you're going to find treasures. God, I know, is faithful to guide you into all truth and to all peace. Just keep seeking Him first. Church, have a great day, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us at Advanced Church Online. It's our hope as a church to help you deepen your relationship with God and strengthen your faith. We would love to connect with you. You can text us, email us, or simply comment below. Or you can always visit our website to get the most up-to-date information. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.